Cool. We're all rolling. We're all good to go. Life's happening. Fuck yeah, dude. Sweet. Episode 70 of From Everyone. I'm here with Shane Frederick returning from episode 17, brother. Welcome back. 17. Oh my goodness. Yes, dude. It feels forever ago. I liked, I went back and watched part of it this morning and it felt like unwatchable to me, which was very happy to me because it was like, oh, I was so rigid then. And it's like a clear growth from then to now of like, now I feel like I can watch my own episodes, which is kind of conceited, but like, I feel like I'm having enough fun with it that I listen to it and go, oh, let's see people having fun. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I went back and watched 17 and it was like, oh, that's someone trying to do a thing. And that was like, oh, dang. But that's learning. That's but you know what? what? Humble is. beginnings. And I'm glad to have been yes. part of that. Yes. You know? It's been real fun. I think, yeah, I think that's the key of it is like, I'm, uh, I was just talking last week on the podcast. So like, I guess it'll be out in two days when we're recording this, but last week in my universe uh, of like, I enjoy keeping my early catalog intact because I want everyone to go see the first music video I made. And I want you to go like, wow, this sucks. I want you to go back and be like, dude, my iPhone can do this. And then I want you to be able to watch all of the fucking eight years till now and go, oh, okay, this is doable. And there's something to me that's like very important of like, and yeah, episode one of the podcast is a similar thing of like, I don't know if episode one is my favorite thing I've ever created, <laughs> But I refuse to get rid of those because I think it's important that you see this and go, oh, this looks cool. Episode one didn't look as cool. Didn't sound as good. It didn't look as good. Like, yeah, there's a growth there that I'm proud of. And I, it's important to me to keep intact. I just like the preservation of like yes. even uh, I was reminiscing with my cousin not too long about about like the old Internet, like yes. old YouTube videos mm -hmm. and how those things are memorialized and. Mm -hmm. maintaining that archive regardless if, of how critical you might be about your own work and yes. you hate it or love it i just i i like to go back mm -hmm. and just review even stuff that i've done in the past you know like yes. crappy you know phone drum covers mm -hmm. and like playing paintball and all this stuff and yeah yeah because yeah. it, it's more of like a nostalgia thing to me too like mm -hmm. I, as i approach oh my god do i dare, dare say early 30s <laughs> I, I i find myself really just looking back and mm -hmm. getting caught in nostalgia of all of that stuff yes you know uh so. i this is a random tangent we have a lot of great things to get into uh the first one that i'll plug before i tell my random tangent here uh shane has a, a project out called late in self right now there's a single out right now that is streaming everywhere and i think it is worth listening to i think it's awesome and i want to chat about Thank that you. Uh, and i wanted to get that out before i go on my other completely unrelated rant and then we'll get back to late in self <laughs> uh, my unrelated rant here is that when i was starting the podcast one of the projects that like preceded this uh was that my grandfather was in world war ii uh and he kept a journal he kept like a diary with him uh, and when he passed, uh, that diary went through my family and ended up in my hands. Uh, and so I went through and I like transcribed this journal to like give it as a gift to my family. So I took photos of each like handwritten page and then I, yeah, transcribed it so that we could then print it into a new book. So in the new book, there's like a picture of his words and then like a written verse cause his handwriting sucked ass. Um, but he was in world war II. He was in the air force. He went over, he did bombing runs. Like he did the whole shit. And like my grandpa was, I don't know, 75 when I was born. I don't know exactly, but like whatever. He was, he was a grown man. And like by the time I have memories of him, he was far too old to like, he was just an old guy, which just sounds so shitty to say, but like I loved him, but I'd never quite connected with him because the age gap sure. and the time gap was so enormous. Yeah. And then going back and reading his diary was like, oh, I know this guy now. Like it was a really intimate look of like who my grandfather was and what he cared about and what scared and what kept him up at night. And so in the past, and that is where to your point of like making a time capsule of shit of like the nostalgia of it is like, I recognize that I'm making a time capsule mm -hmm. and like all my people that I'm chatting with now, like we're going to go our separate ways. And at some point we're going to be 55 and go, damn, remember point beach, remember how fucking <sighs> sick that was. And I am aware very much that what I'm doing is creating a time capsule of all of these memories of all these people that I've met. So that like when we go our separate ways, when someone, fuck, one of our friends moves to Texas and goes, yeah, what's Shane up to? It's like, here's what Shane's up to. I yeah. can give you that. And I, that is one of my favorite parts of the podcast is this idea of like, yeah, I'm creating a time capsule that isn't the most valuable right now, but I'm really excited of what that is in the future. And just like sure. to have all my friends cemented in time and like in the most honest way, right? Like I, I have photos of you on stage, but like, that's not Shane. That is like my art of Shane. This is Shane. Like what's going to happen in the next hour is as unfiltered of Shane. Yep. Yes. And that is a really exciting piece of this to me is like, I am, yeah, it's not a World War II time capsule. It doesn't yeah. have the, the global ties that it has, but like there is something, yeah, really valuable in preserving time and memory and people. And like, this feels like the most organic way that I could think to do it. Yeah. Um, that, that's, a, that's actually incredible. Yeah. And you know, kudos to you to do, to do that. Cause I, I'm sure it's, you know, it's not an easy task to sure. transcribe all of that stuff. And 
I know we got a bunch of stuff to cover, but I, I just kind of want to. I just kind of want to make a point about like the please. preservation of please, like please, media please. and stuff like that. Take me on a journey. Yeah. Um, you know, we're we're similar in age, yep. and I just find it very interesting that um, you know, there's videos of me as a little kid with the, you know, the handy cams mm -hmm. and even some Polaroids and yep. uh, the disposable cameras, but my nephews, you know, who are much younger than I am, who mm -hmm. are. Uh, if my brother's watching this, I'm sorry. Uh, approaching ten, and in the, in the, in the little guy, um, they created email addresses for them when they were born. I've heard about people doing that. That's a brilliant idea. Yes. And myself and others have been sending them emails and pictures of them, and to like that. It's just such a strange kind of, I guess, an archival approach to things yep. where. Here's your password when you turn 16, and then you just open up everything, and everything yep. is just captured in pretty much 1080p, full HD, yes. 30 frames a second, where, you know, you just shift back another 10, 20 years, and, you know, you have mm -hmm. handy cams and disposable cameras, and yep. like you're saying, the preservation of media, like, you know, from episode one that you started your podcast on, I mean, who, it's hard to envision where technology is going to go, where the world's going to go. And sure. to even look back 10, 15 years from now, mm -hmm. it's it, this might be considered ancient. Uh, most likely, yeah. Relative math, to math, how, yeah, yeah. like, yeah. you know, how fast technology is changing. Yes. With, We're not going to be in VR. They won't be able to walk into the room <laughs> and hang out with yeah, us. Right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so I just thought uh, it's it's just been something that just has been just really, like, blowing my mind because, like, being in, in you yeah. know, I wouldn't consider myself a 90s kid, even though I was born in 92. Like, sure. I really experienced my teenage, you know, age in, uh, you know, the early 2000s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, you know, the early 2000s is a lot of, like, 90 hand-me-down kind mm -hmm. of cultural aspects. Uh, you know, the just, I guess, the oddities of, you know, if you're out on your bike, uh, make sure you're home before the lights turn on kind <laughs> yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I honestly, I don't really see too many, like, younger kids, like, doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, riding their bikes are just... You know, do I dare say consumed with devices and stuff? But yep. that's just me, just being a old. Oh, it's guy. the same. I think the beauty of the email thing is that it's like a raw, un it's like a a present communication. And like, what I mean by that is like when I have yeah, niece and nephew, or I guess they're my cousin's kids, but whatever, same shit. They're four and six right now, and it's like when they are sixteen, when they get this email address, I can't be like when you were five. I had so much fun playing with you. I had so much fun swimming with you. Like I, that you can't communicate that in the same way that I could write an email today of like, I had so much fun playing with your Legos with you yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And like that, there's something beautiful <laughs> in that, like the presentness of it and the able to communicate with them that you like can't capture in retrospect. There's no way to like, right. uh, yeah, relate back to that moment. Cause they didn't exist in that moment in that some sense. Like, right. It was, it was your moment and they were figuring out the whole universe. They had no idea yeah. that a moment was happening. Yeah. And there's something beautiful in that. Yeah, no, I, um, I took my, my follow-up to my grandpa's project was taking my family's like VHS tapes and like digitizing them so that they're all, yeah, now online. And it was a similar thing of like, I feel like I got to know my parents doing that because like my parents and that would have been, yeah, 35 and I'm 28 now. So it's like as close to them in relationship of age as sure. I can ever be. Yeah. Uh, and it was a really interesting like, oh, and it was nice to meet myself as a little kid and be like, oh, I remember playing with that. That was cool as hell that I got to play with that. That's so cool. Uh, and my sister, same as, yeah, she's a couple years older than I am. So it's like, I didn't know her when she was five or I was two. So what the fuck did I know about the world? And <laughs> yeah. To now go back and be like, oh, my five-year-old sister was cool. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, it'd be a really fun thing. So yeah, the time capsule part of this is to me the coolest part of it. And Absolutely. Like, everything else feels like gravy. And yeah, it's been a, a fun, fun little side project here. On the topic of fun little side projects, uh, Leighton Self. So last time you were here, we were talking about you getting into producing your whole shit by yourself, which is uh, coincidentally actually the second one-man band in a row. The last episode that I have is also a one-man band thing. But it's a fascinating world to me, and there's so much to fucking learn. I'm curious now that like the song came out in February. Like Now that you've had time to like sit on it, reflect on it, like what was that process like? What stands out to you now that you've had a couple of months to like reflect on it? Uh, it's actually a very similar approach and uh, perspective that you take with your own material. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, after I had gone through the whole process of, you know, I mean, I, I started from absolute no knowledge green, uh, I guess where we share that perspective, I'm already like looking back at it. I'm like, oh, there's things that I could have done differently. And 100%. of course I can go back and revise things, but I've already kind of like put it out in, in the, you know, mm -hmm. in the, uh, the public air and it's on YouTube and stuff. Um, but it, it, since, yeah, since, what, episode 17 was 17, it? 17, yeah. I should 17. have written the date. I don't actually remember. But if it's 
Yeah, f- whatever. It's like a couple Quick of years maths, ago? 53. So- it's about a year ago, probably. It's probably almost a year to the day. I'm not going to check it on my phone right the second, but it's, yeah, it's Clo- 53 episodes in 52 weeks in a year, so it's probably pretty close to pretty a year. Pretty close to yeah. a year. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I do recall, I, I don't even think I had gotten my computer yet. I think I was just talking about mm-hmm. piecing everything together yeah. and, you know, pulling some heads together and helping and looking for some guidance as mm-hmm. to what I need to do and how to start. Um, and here we are. I've, you know, produced my first little single. Congratulations. Thank Hell you. Yes. It's, you know, I, I'm not, it's just for fun. It's mm-hmm. it's more for me than anything else. Um, you know, as much as I love being like the, one of the CT drummers that fills in for bands here and there, I, I wanted to kind of push what I mm-hmm. kind of know and just have your own thing just for once. try yeah. taking approach to uh, a more compositional thing with guitars and bass and mm-hmm. synthesizers and learning about you know tunings and scales and how to you know making sure I'm programming yes it is all programmed <laughs> for the record I'm sorry everyone that just absolutely hate MIDI but <laughs> MIDI MIDI stuff too nowadays not to go on a total tangent yes. sounds pretty cool like for for me like mm-hmm. if I if I'm in a band or I join a group or whatever I can now just provide some sample riffs or whatever instead mm-hmm. of just being like oh here's a cool beat or here's a cool groove yes um so it's, it's such a lifesaver yeah it, it really is yeah. and it's and like we were talking about before we started uh the the podcast of of just having such a a concrete creative outlet because you know you and i are very like-minded like that i just mm-hmm. i love to just make stuff and create stuff and yes it's just it's a wiring thing, and yep. uh, it's just a lot of fun, especially during the winter. You know how the winters are. They're just yeah. they're not even fun winters anymore. They're just rainy and gloomy. There's yep. no, like, cool <laughs> snowstorms anymore. Here's another not thing. When we a were snowman. kids, yeah, you know. just mad that I can't drive to the <laughs> store. Yeah. So it just kind of gets dreary out. So that's I think that was pretty much my biggest uh, motivator to to do that mm-hmm. just because, you know, the, the days are short, not too much to do. And, yep. you know, there's that band Carmen Jocka that I had stumbled on back in the day, and Back in the day, it was only like a couple years ago. Um, I don't know if you introduced me to them or someone else did, but I have a vivid memory of typing in like C A R M E N, and really, yeah, like nothing comes <laughs> up. Like Carmen, first name, Jocko, last name. <laughs> it took me so long to find the band. They fucking rule. They're they, they're so awesome. sick. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that was also a motivator to just start making music because it was something that just absolutely, you know, I was like head over heels for. And mm-hmm. there's so much music out nowadays, and and it, it's like a I don't know if a double-edged sword is the correct way to describe it, but uh, there's so much music that's being produced, but it's so hard to find so much stuff mm-hmm. because there's so many platforms. Yeah. Um, I personally still just use YouTube Yep. because um, I know a lot of like underground stuff isn't typically on Spotify or mm-hmm. any of the big streaming platforms. Most of it, I guess, maybe still resides on YouTube. That's I, I mean, they, they are on all those streaming platforms, sure. but I did stumble upon them on, mm-hmm. on YouTube, of course. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I just started writing shortly after the episode 17, and uh, it was just a lot of YouTubing, yeah. YouTube University, hitting up all my friends that have been in the game for a long time. And we were, like we were talking about before, this the, the scene here and the musicians that come out of Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Jersey, New York, it's, it's, we're very fortunate. Mm-hmm. Um, Everyone is just so talented. It keeps everyone honest. And mm-hmm. I definitely feel like there is, you know, a heavy collective, you know, atmosphere to that. And everyone that I've asked questions for, any anyone that I've reached out regarding, you know, if it's production, if it's certain plugins to use, what, you know, settings in a DAW. I mean, it could be anything. And mm-hmm. everyone's just so willing to was so willing to help me and just be like, oh, try this. Oh, I can pop over. Yep. Bring your computer over. Love to show you how this works. And everyone is just so passionate about it. So mm-hmm. it, everyone just gets so excited about everyone's projects. And I, I even say, you know, to my parents, I'm, you know, I, I've done a lot of traveling around the country and I've seen a lot of beautiful national parks and states, but I don't think I'll ever go anywhere other than probably New England. Interesting. I'm going to be a diehard here forever. I'm probably the same <laughs> way. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I've ever 
seriously consider. I've had, yeah, I had little ideas of like, maybe this, maybe that. I have yeah. friends here, maybe that. But yeah, this feels like home yeah. very much. Uh, I'm curious, like on the, the writing process of doing your own thing. Like, I feel like as a drummer by trade, my, my outsider perspective here is that drummers usually get like excluded from the writing room where normally like someone writes a guitar riff and they program like MIDI drums. And then you go in and take the MIDI drums and like add life to them. But you're more so like remixing and making it human than you are like actually writing a new part. Was this like the first time that you were actually writing or have you been able to write in the past? Yeah. What's the, was your first writing experience or yeah. Have you seen um, the past? So f it, it, I guess it kind of depends on the project. Mm -hmm. um, so the green invaders, for example, um, Mr. Sean Shaw has had material like <laughs> man's a machine. Just... I feel like he has 7,000 <laughs> songs. I could come out tomorrow. Yeah. I, I can call him like, and like hang up, hang up, hang up the phone with him and then call him back the next day and be like, Oh yeah, I wrote like three more songs. Check it out. <laughs> Mixed master, ready to go. I should get him out here. Yeah, <laughs> I just want to add to my list. Um, so it it kind of depends. A lot of the projects that I have joined or played drums for, I've more or less had to have learned. I, I learn mm -hmm. because it's already it's already out in the yes in the ether. Um, the only thing that I've contributed guitar wise is for my own project. Mm -hmm. And that's again, it's not it's not because anyone's you Someone know gatekeep, you gatekeeping the, yeah. the the creative process. Yeah. It's it's not like that at all. It's just what I'm I've been kind of introduced to. Mm -hmm. If it was construct paradise for a little bit, mm -hmm. um, I, I've written uh, some drums for a couple tracks there. Avalation, uh, Green Invaders. Mm -hmm. It's just more learning. Like that's yeah. been my role for a long time, yep. and I really don't mind that. Yeah. I actually kind of enjoy it because there is a little bit of like stress. I don't, maybe not even stress, but a lot, a little bit more responsibility and a, a little bit more output that's needed to contribute on more of the mm -hmm. guitars and the composition stuff. Yeah. Um, so like recent bands that I fil filled in for, it's just learning sets, mm -hmm. which is cool for me. I, I like kind of being the hired gun guy, you know, mm -hmm. um, if there's other opportunities that present themselves in the future, if it's with Green Invaders or another project, or I, I continue my path on the Late and Self solo project, you know I'm all in. I, I just I, I'm very open to kind of anything that comes my way. Yeah, and uh, I just enjoy playing drums for for what it is. Even like I was saying, my solo project, mm -hmm. like I'm not trying to do anything crazy with it. If, yeah. if if there was some guitar player that really was super hyped about it and like wanted to learn it or Mm -hmm. wanted to redo it and they're like hey can we put real guitars on this i'd be like of course yeah yeah why not hell yeah you know if, if they wanted to play if you're live, listening kings yeah, there's opportunity you know, it's nothing crazy you know <laughs> it's uh you know coming from a drummer's mind so it might sound a little funky to, sure. to some but it's like i said it's it's for it's for fun we were chatting uh i saw you at a show a couple nights ago which was brilliant shout out bearing point shout out edith e yes Edict. I almost said Edith, and I was like, "That's not. That's not the right thing." <laughs> Shout out Edict. Uh, yes, brilliant show. Uh, we were chatting there a little bit. Or I was saying how like I I feel like I'm just understanding drums enough that I feel like I unlocked this like whole side quest, like this whole layer of music that I just never been aware of. And it sounds like you had a similar experience of like 100%. discovering all these different layers of like, yeah, you've been in music your whole life more so than I have. You know the drums better than I know any instrument at all. And you still were like, what the fuck is a guitar? <laughs> well, exactly. And the thing is, there is another dimension of complexity to it because mm -hmm. I I don't know how to, how to play the piano. Yep. I just know how to play drums. Yep. So I, I'm trying to, and of course, there's a bunch of information on YouTube, but there's the translation of playing the guitar and certain chords that has to be played on the sure. piano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, it's cool because on a piano you know, you only have to play like a chord in one place where you can play a chord on a guitar multiple places. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, oh, that's cool. It's an out of sight, out of mind thing, but I'm doing myself a disservice if I'm just going to learn how to program the music and never actually learn how to pl physically play the guitar. Yeah. But for just like the, I guess the educational, um, compositional purpose, it's, it's perfect for me. Mm -hmm. So if I'm like talking with a guitar player, I can now more or less relate on a more, uh, musical level instead of just hey check out this groove i could be like oh this is in uh you know g sharp and this is the progressions these are the chords that i'm using blah 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 so it's cool because i i feel like i'm like this like this armchair you know monday quarterback guitar <laughs> yep. player in yep. some weird fashion but um it's just it's and it's good i i think all knowledge is great too mm -hmm. you know i i love just learning about stuff and um yep. 
you know, I know we're going to touch about the whole solar eclipse thing a little bit later. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> yes. That was my grand finale. Yeah, no. But I just, I love to learn stuff, yeah. you know. Um, Same. I like to learn something from everyone. There's a whole podcast about it. Self-proclaimed science guy. <laughs> 100% dude uh it's been fascinating I think it's a, a really weird thing of like there's so many layers of this that we don't appreciate and until you have to like put your own two hands on that but it's so hard to appreciate all the different pieces that go in did you ever put your two hands on a guitar in this process like was it all digital did you learn to play at all do you have some basic guitar knowledge like I took uh a, a guitar class in college for a for a credit uh, sure and um that was pretty much it that's where all my guitar playing went um, I really that that's probably my biggest regret because I you know I was doing that my God almost ten years ago now mm -hmm. and I always say if you know woulda coulda shoulda if I stuck with it you know would I be playing guitar on a more I guess perf like perf amateur professional level yeah. where I could actually play in a band because um, I, I feel like there's so many people out of Connecticut and Mass that are multi instrumentalists mm -hmm. and they're it's not like they're okay at one or the other like. They're very proficient they at all, both, yeah. and I'm just like, must be nice. Yep. Yeah, I'm watching Boomer there with the Edict, and it's like, dude, how many instruments can you play? <laughs> right? Fuck it. That whole band, that whole uh, Euclid, every one of them is like, dude, what? do less. It's so annoying how good they all it's are at everything. <laughs> Fuck it. Yeah, Kevin's producing everything. <laughs> Matty has 19 different bands, and he plays <laughs> all the instruments in every one of them. Boomer's up there in nine bands. Matt plays drums in a way that fucking no one else does. Like, it's just, I'm leaving out Zach, I guess. Zach's brilliant. I mean, like, it's just such an overwhelming group of talented Masters. guys. Masters. That it's, yeah, you're right. It's hard sometimes to pick something up where you look at all the pros doing it. It's like, I, what am I contributing to this? Yeah. And I think you're right. The process of learning is the important part there of like <clears throat> even getting better at guitar, like or learning the fundamentals of guitar. Like even if you never pick up a guitar, it makes you a better drummer. Like it makes you more oh, musically educated and that all yes. transpires everywhere else. And yep. I think for me, it's similar of like learning drums doesn't, I don't give a fuck about being a drummer. I'm not going to be in a band. I don't want to get on stage. Like there's nothing about that that's appealing to me. It's just kind of a fun little thing, but for sure it's been better at music videos. For sure it's made me more, like, I feel like I have no rhythm. And for sure, that is like that is all rhythm. That is the only thing that drums are, is rhythm. There's yeah. no tuning. There's no pitch to be worried about. It's right. just stay on time. Yep. And, like, that is so much enriched where I, I – my assumption is if I look back at my past music videos, probably I was cutting on on the beat more than I realized, right? Like, probably on, on one, there was a cut more often than I realized. But now I can be aware of it. And mm -hmm. that feels like a huge benefit of, like, yeah, knowing what I'm doing instead of just doing it because it feels right. Now I can be like, oh, I'm doing this because – Yeah. And then I can also deviate from it because and know that I'm deviating from the norm. And it's just, sure. yeah, it's a whole tier of information that I assume as a drummer is so much, uh, I assume there's a similar translation there of like, yeah, learning what an E chord is. It doesn't make you better at blast beats, but it makes you more musically aware. And then, you know, okay, a blast beat belongs here. Or I was just going to reiterate and, that you hit the nail on the head. Like they, they might be kind of two totally independent mm -hmm. schools of thought, but like, you know, under kind of the same general umbrella that yeah. they, in, in some respect, they might translate to one another for for me like writing guitar parts i um i realized that i now have a more of a i don't know what the like the propensity to write drums more musically sure instead of just laying down a groove um, interesting and like we were talking about earlier um i'm 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 good i'm good i'm good 32 years old healthy you know i i exercise a lot i eat clean I do like except for Domino's before the podcast <laughs> and of course light. Shout out Domino's and Coors Light. Shout out dietitians everywhere. <laughs> oh my Get God. in shape with this one little secret. I, I just do feel a little bit of the hardware working against me, mm -hmm. um, and I, I find myself. I can still play the stuff that I have been for years, but I definitely have to stretch. I definitely mm -hmm. have to warm up a little bit more. Yep. I find myself having to tweak my gear and my throne height and my pedal settings a little <laughs> bit more and having to kind of just make things a little bit more ergonomic. I can't mm -hmm. just sit on the on a kit and just wail away. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. You're not sleeping on air mattresses as easily anymore. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> yep. Um, but I guess inadvertently, it's made me want to be more dynamic and focus on another aspect of drumming. Because for I think for most people in like a metal scene – you know, I, I think most drummers prioritize going quick. Yeah. You know, yep. and that and that is the scene right now for for music and and mm. drums, it's blast beats. It's you know, it's it's quick quickness on the kicks, which is awesome. Um, 
you know, I, I, I dabble in it, but it's not like my go-to style mm -hmm. and I, nothing against it. Cause I know there's this, Oh, I don't even want to, I don't want to even entertain <laughs> this, this whole, this duality. Um, but there is this big thing between like, uh, Trigger I kicks. knew you were going to say the T word. <laughs> <laughs> I could feel I'm it coming. I'm so sorry. I, I know nothing about drums, and even I knew what was coming there. Two big points. Gent is a genre, <laughs> and triggers aren't cheating. Yeah. So... Hey, I'm 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 walking a fine line here. Sure. Um, it's just two different. It's just two different styles of music, and yeah. you use certain tools for certain, you know, mm -hmm. for certain jobs. Um, it's just something that you know I, I I've I've you know practiced my blast beats. I've you know kind of figured out like the double the 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 uh, heel toe heel, heel toe technique and stuff like that. Um, for what I'm doing musically, it's it's not really anything that I would typically do. Maybe mm -hmm. I'd like showcase it for like a for like a second. Sure. N like no shade. Like it's just it's just my bread and butter. Mm -hmm. You know, I I just rather do like more of the groovy kind of stuff. Yeah. Um. So I guess going back to what what I was getting into before is I, I find myself wanting to be a bit more um, dynamic in my playing, mm -hmm. and I took lessons actually over the fall of last year hell yeah okay uh with a real sick cat isaac Mons, um out of guitar center in southington he was teaching there interesting very cool. um sick That's sick an... sick cat talk to me Gospel about like chops kids nasty i think he's he, i think he's uh just turned 30 um he's got like a sabian endorsement like i mean the kids like just chops are sick super tight uh humbled me very quickly mm -hmm. and that's why you know because i i'm i'm one of those one of those guys like you can never stop learning you know you should never get complacent with anything mm -hmm. um whether it's music or improving your you know your craft if if, yeah. if it's uh if it's the podcast thing if it's music if it's drawing yeah. it doesn't matter any any creative outlet or anything that you're striving to like because i don't even really like that whole sky's the limit thing because mm -hmm. it's like i feel like it's just it's kind of like a uh, paradoxical to like okay so if you hit the sky what are you just gonna settle right there? You know. I think it also underestimates how much like the sky's the limit, but the planet's a big fucking place. You're not hitting the sky in every <laughs> yeah, direction, right? right? Like there's yeah. Uh, my tangent here is I've been learning golf. We were chatting about that, and like I've had a ton of fun with that, and it's been real fun to like be a complete novice at something of just like like start from scratch, from like you were saying with the computer of like yeah, literally square one. Uh, I took one lesson, and it like it shocked me how much in half an hour how much an expert could transform my knowledge of something. And it was incredible of like, fuck, I, yeah. And, and he said three words. I was like, oh, my game, I am better at golf now. You fixed everything. Uh, or not everything. There's still, still a lot of scary <laughs> right there. But um, my parallel here is that like learning golf, like one of the big skills I've had to take in is like, take a breath, like focus, be present, like don't rush, don't stress out. And that's something that has come back in my video of like, there's a moment where I'm on a video set and it's like, oh, if I rush in golf, I hit this ball into the woods. If I just take a breath, I have a way better chance of going where sure. I want to go. And that's one of those lessons that, yeah, golf is not music videos, but it has transpired or crossed over. Uh, my dad growing up, I uh, my parents were both teachers, and I hated school like any other good kid would. <laughs> and so it was always this like butting of heads of them being like, no, give the teachers a chance. And me being like, no, everyone sucks. This whole thing sucks. This is stupid. I have to go do this. Like, fuck everything. And not that my third grade self was like, fuck everything. But the, <laughs> the sentiment. I was like, wow, I really got into you early, <laughs> yes, huh? Yes. No, the sentiment transpired. Uh, my dad was always, uh, his thing to me at the time was always, and it made me so mad at the time. It was like, if you learn how to do something, you'll learn how to do anything. And it made me so mad. Because I was like, dad, math isn't making me, like, I don't, I want to play soccer. I'm going to play soccer my whole life, dad. I'm in third grade, but I know I'm going to the World Cup. There's nothing you can do to stop me. <laughs> and social studies isn't going to help me get there. Yeah. Uh, and it always made me mad. And now I'm sitting here as an adult going like, oh, he was right. And I hate that. <laughs> I hate admitting he was right. Uh, he's a brilliant man. But yes, it, it, it's very much taking my own medicine. Of like, I have to just swallow my pride. But like, it is that. Oh. The, the thank you, you'll thank me one day. Yes, it sentiment. is that. And it's, yeah. it is a pro it's like you're saying, as you learn, it's just you learn everything. And learning yeah. how to learn is part of that skill. And that's what school was teaching me. And like, yeah. yes, maybe I haven't used all my chemistry knowledge. I didn't need to calculate molecules and atoms and all that bullshit. But certainly in sitting down and learning how to learn chemistry was like, oh, that's how I learned video. That's how I mm -hmm. learned this thing. That's how I got the discipline to sit at my computer and recognize that I was getting better and like how practice works and why sure. homework is important. And it's like, Fuck, like, I wish in third grade I was a little bit nicer to him <laughs> <laughs> because he was right. Yeah. He nailed it. Um, I was going somewhere back. I was circling back to somewhere with this. And I don't fucking know where it was. Um, we're talking about being green, learning shit. Um, I don't know. Um, just this idea that, yeah, learning everything makes us better. And I wish I remembered where I was circling back to because I felt like I had a nice 
a nice little loop to go there. But um, it wasn't about it wasn't about the solar eclipse, was it? No, no, we can <laughs> <laughs> too early. Shay. Stop jumping the gun. We're teaser. I hate that. I hate Everyone it. listening is like, what the fuck yeah, is this eclipse? This is a big one. Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> no. Um, hell yeah. So now that you've had the time to like reflect on the project, is it are you still satisfied with it? Are there still things you want to tweak? Are you inspired to number two? Are you saying I'm never gonna write a song again? Like, what's your what's your next project? Oh, it dries the desert, man. Yeah. Like I I, I did the one song because I, I feel like that's something I've wanted to do for so long. Mm -hmm. Even years ago, when I was in Avalation, I always said to myself, I'd love to be able to make a song mm -hmm. by myself. Yeah. I'd like to somehow translate what I have in my head to you know, something that's audible for somebody else. Because mm -hmm. it, it, it's kind of ironic, because anytime I go to a concert with any of my buddies, usually it's you know, music friends. Of, you yeah. know, we're, we went to see, uh, oh my God, Avola. Uh, Mm -hmm. So like my all all time favorite band. Okay. And they they had done their second U.S. tour last year, and I, I pretty much anywhere they come within the states, I don't care if they're in California. I'm jumping on a plane. I'm going to see them. Hell yes. Um, I find it very strange that a lot of guitar players watch the drummer more. Mm -hmm. Where when I'm watching the band, I'm only watching the guitar player. Interesting. Yeah, it's I kind know. of like a want what you can't have kind of thing. Inter so, sure. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. I just always found it maybe because I I just can't put like I don't I don't want to limit myself and say I I can't play the guitar. I just don't think I have the discipline right now where I'm at in my life to just sit there yeah. and start hammering out yes the actual learning yeah, process yeah, yeah. of it. Yep. So that's why for me it's just like oh I can just play around with a keyboard and program the sounds until it sounds cool and make sure it's like actually ergonomically correct for a guitar player to play. Yes. Because there's been a couple times, <laughs> no no uh, shade on guitar players, but sometimes they'll be writing That's some classic, crazy sorry. drums yeah, and I'm yeah, just yeah. like, I don't know if this is even possible. I don't have seven <laughs> limbs. Like, this is cool, but... I'm like, I see three crash cymbal hits, two toms, <laughs> and like 30, 33 bass drum hits in like a nanosecond. Yeah. So I, I've taken the like a very systematic approach to guitar composition. Like in, in the DAW, it sounds kind of weird, but I pretty much have like a template that I mm -hmm. have for myself. Um... And I, and I sound probably super green, but like I like G like a G sharp tuning seven string guitar. That's kind of like a genty mm -hmm. prog kind of basis for for guitars, right? Okay. So every time I start a new project, I just copy that file and I rename it to something. So at least now I don't have mm -hmm. to be like, oh, I'm working with so many frets, or I'm like, yep. I have to, you know, I I don't know like. You know, I don't know where the key change like gives you some foundation. It to does. Build it's from. just an yep. easy like I have all my, all my all the MIDI tracks ready to go where I can just start plugging in drums and just hammering away without having to configure everything every single time. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, this is someone who's only been learning this for I don't know since the last time we've been yeah. hanging out um, yes. last last year when we did the episode seventeen. Um, I remember my little tangent here. Oh, so here. I started with talking about golf lessons, and then I got my dad teach me shit. Uh, before golf lessons, you mentioned that you took a uh, drum lessons recently from yes. this expert at Guitar Center. Uh, I was very curious of like, what was it like? Hi, Jack. Uh, yeah. What was it like taking drums now that you know drums? Where for me, like going to take golf lessons was so easy because it's like, oh, this guy can teach me everything. I know zero. Like anything he says to me is going to be great. Yeah. I think like a videography lesson would be hard for me to walk into now because it feels like it would be tough for them to like gauge where I am and what I know and what mm. I don't know. And like, I'm, I'm a mutt in a sense. So like I'm an expert in this thing and I'm maybe a beginner in this thing, but yeah. it, like it's all mismatched. And I assume with the drummer, it's the same thing of like you went in with your strengths and your weaknesses, but it's much different than going in from a baseline zero. Yeah. What was it like going and taking lessons so, as a competent drummer? Great, uh, great point. So when I came in for my first lesson, he, um, look at Jack. So chat. I, I love Shut Jack. Out. I'm trying to pet him. So he's <laughs> talking. Buddy. Um, so when I, when I came in for my first lesson, um, it was, hello, how are you? Mm -hmm. You know, what do you like? Yeah. Um, you know, how long you've been playing, set up the drums, take your time, get super comfortable. And he just pretty much said, just start, start, start jamming away. Mm -hmm. Jack, a little, Jack, a little Quick, pet. Got it. Got it. Uh, so he, yeah, he said, do something and I'll pick it up from there. Yeah. Um, so I started, you know, I was trying to do some flashy stuff, mm -hmm. you know, trying to showcase like, you know, my strengths and, yeah. you know, doing some nice groove stuff, mm -hmm. mixing up some paradiddles, doubles, all you, you know, trying stuff. to do that sure. stuff. And, um, 
you know, kind of gave me like a nice nod of approval. And then he showed me what he could do. And I was just like, <laughs> ah, so. Okay. So it's like I'm starting over There's again. There's levels, yeah. Um, and, and it wasn't like a, uh, like a, you know, like a trying to show up, you know, he, he, it was just a very like humbling kind of perspective for me. And mm -hmm. I wanted to show him right away what I'm capable of. Yeah. So we're not wasting each other's time. So that's why I tried going like pretty crazy in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So he knows where I kind of stand baseline wise. Yeah. And then, he, I mean, he's super smart. So he, he had already kind of tailored like, uh, kind of a curriculum for me and, like like hardcore critiquing he's like oh your right hand's higher than you know than your left hand when we're doing like all the, like the uh the snare exercises and he would stop me every time you know if it, if, it, if something wasn't to his standard which was great mm -hmm. frustrating for me not because he was stopping me but knowing how many bad habits i've developed sure. over yeah, yeah, yeah you know um for such a period of time so like lessons to me is kind of like a like a like a two like a two pan kind of approach. It's like, yes, you can learn stuff, but it's also Course a time correction. to unlearn things, mm -hmm. which I think is just as valuable. Yeah. You know, because I, I haven't taken lessons, dude, since I was probably 13, 14 years old. And, you know, I I definitely feel there was there's like critical times and good times when to take lessons. Um my my drum teacher, I think I probably even mentioned him in the last episode, Clark Siebold, like love him to death one of the sickest drummers i know great dude um there was a time when he was like really trying to sh like show me some serious material mm -hmm. that i just don't think i was intellectually mature enough to handle like okay. i still wanted to like rip around and go fast and jam yeah. to tracks and stuff like that instead of taking a more um educational approach which you know i don't i don't regret but like i do wish i i had taken lessons a little bit more seriously back then because mm -hmm. i definitely think i would be in a probably a different caliber musician now sure. a little bit um did you go into lessons now like with a with a problem you were trying to solve or was it just like let me go see what he can offer me exactly that just i wanted to That's take like lessons. brave of you i feel like i would yeah i feel like i wouldn't do that and it probably would benefit me to do it but i yeah somehow my hard-headed stubborn nature just isn't oh, <laughs> wouldn't dude, be the first thing i would do yeah i am just very open to learning and um you know especially like we talked about last time, I keep segue like referring to last time, but uh, you know, I I just look at all of the like the younger drummers that are up and coming mm -hmm. now, and like they're they're like disgusting. Yeah, and it's like they're growing up with the stuff that I I was listening to not too long ago. Like when I was playing drums, I was like listening to like Disturb, Slipknot, Kill Switch, Engage, and stuff. Mm -hmm. And now like the younger drummers are like listening to like Volumes, Periphery, yeah. Veil of My. I mean, they've been around for a while, but that's kind of like their. Or like That's late teenage, yeah. like yeah. kind of getting into that, and you're already ahead of the ball game if that's what's gonna inspire you to play drums. Yeah, you that, know that's always a trend. My favorite example of this recently yeah. was that uh, Tony Hawk makes his like 900 is the big thing that he does, which is two and a half rotations around. Some nine year old just landed three in a row in a competition, <laughs> and it was like holy fuck! Like Tony Hawk literally shook the world by doing this one time, and a nine year old just did it three times in a row. And I don't even know if they won. I think they just did it, and we're like, oh, that's a cool thing I did, and that was that. And yeah, the, the scaling of the talent is always wild to be the aware of. Yeah. Training regimens have changed yeah. tremendously. Like just the nutrition, the training plans. Like yeah. they were showing um, Olympic athletes, I think from yeah. like I, I don't yeah, know yeah, if you yeah. maybe I, I just saw it on like a reel on social media or okay, something like that. Sure. But it it was very kind of interesting to see uh, humans like not even you know fifty six years ago, mm -hmm. um, still I mean top. Com competitors sure. on the planet. running a mile faster than i can but also we're plumbers and <laughs> drinking beers every night yeah <laughs> i know right i'm like yeah hey, i'm eating healthy mm -hmm. and trying to maintain my temple and uh yep chugging a course light <laughs> and, and scarfing down dominoes enjoying a course light we're not <laughs> chugging nothing over here we're sipping out some fine liquor that's right <laughs> some finely aged uh, course lights dude cold as the fucking rockies dude mm -hmm. shout out colorado <laughs> The whole state. Support your mountains. <laughs> Support your local peaks. <laughs> um, but I just found it very interesting to see um, how much of the training regimen, nutritional perspectives have changed, and to see the output so dramatically. Yeah. Like how how expressed it is. It shows yep. you know the you know 1950 guys you know running like like mad, <laughs> but then now 2023 2024 it's like. They're breaking the records like 
yeah. you know, it's like walking and running compared to like the fifties and sixties. Yeah. So that's why, that's why I, I'm so re- like receptive to lessons and learning stuff from people because there's the younger guys are, they, they already have, they're starting yeah. off on a, on a, on a better foot, I yeah. think. Interesting. And, yeah. You know, I, I just want to, I still want to be known, you know, I, mm-hmm. I want, I want to be a guy that that bands want to hire. Cause I, I love that stuff, you know? And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, at some point I'm going to get old and I don't know if I'm going to be able to rip blast beats and go crazy, you know? Cause like, like I was telling you, I, I've, I've played hard my whole life. I I've been, you know, just playing paint competitive paintball for years. Hell yes. Um, just doing dumb stuff at shows and pits. Like I've sustained so many stupid injuries, <laughs> like in pits, like blown it like i have a ruptured meniscus in my knee from from that oh like, shout out meniscus yeah, gang yeah. that's me too brother <laughs> are you serious yeah dude. Yo. Uh, i i ripped my uh bicep tendon playing paintball nice. like i have all of like these little things that are just adding adding yeah. up you yeah. know what i mean so yeah. I, i'm trying to like really just go easy and like yeah. maintaining the temple and just trying to stay healthy yeah and not wear away already that i've already lost kind of thing sure so yeah and and, and i guess that goes th- for the educational piece too. That's why I just, you know, if there's any, I, I'm always asking drummers mm-hmm. all the time. Like anytime I see friends or, you know, I'm like, Hey, let's have a shed, you know, bring your kit to the studio. I'll yeah. bring my kit to your spot. Let's just do it. And you know, I, I know it's a lot to ask for. Cause you know, to lug a kit around and you know, it's sure no one just wants to do it for a shed. Yeah. You know, it's more for a show, but yeah. I, I, that's where I think uh, a lot of the creative flow comes from. And I, I like that that collaboration peer to peer live setting where you're just kind of jamming, which I only did, you know, when I did lessons, Mm -hmm. um, there is no real other setting that would allow that where I can just sit at a kit. Someone else is sitting, we got a metronome going or we're just playing off each other. Like that's super fun. As you were saying this, I've tried to like, I've been like, Oh, that would be cool to do with my camera. And I can't, I would, yeah, exactly your point. It's like, I was trying to imagine what the video equivalent is of like being in a shed with another drummer. And I don't know what that is. Like I, I have sat in a room and edited with people, but like, it's not the same. Like we're all we're working independently. I guess it would yeah. be like if we went and filmed the same thing and then came back and traded footage. But it's like uh, that just doesn't happen. That just isn't a thing. I guess yeah. maybe I don't make it happen. Maybe it's a bit more honest way to put that. Of like I am more interested in like moving forward than I am in like doing this thing for the sake of doing it. Like I think mm-hmm. part of what I like about the music video is like everything is a purpose. Everything gets released. Like I don't. There are very few things I do that don't get released. And like I, as I've been learning, uh, Unreal Engine has been my new oh, thing. Oh, cool. Uh, so getting into that, getting into 3D stuff, like I, nice. I, there are some stuff I've done in that that doesn't see the light of day. That's very much a training exercise. But even that, like I would think I would do better to set aside. Uh, Sean Dalkey was on here one time, and I don't know if he's still doing it, but at the time was saying that like every Sunday night, he like makes it a point of like, I'm going to make something that will never see the light of day. I'm going to make something just to for the sake of like, how do I learn the key of G major better? How do I learn this synthesizer? Like whatever the thing was. Uh, And that really stuck with me. It's like, yeah, that would be great for me. Like if I had the discipline, if I could make the time to do that, that is the way to get better at a thing is to do stuff that doesn't go anywhere, to do stuff just for the sake of doing it. Yeah. Uh, And I think I I try and inherit that. And yeah, it ends up just not being how I spend my time. But there is a a beauty in that, that I wish that cameras had the way that drummers do. Like, yeah, let's go sit in a drum. Let's go sit in a shed together and like play paradiddles back and forth and figure shit out. And yeah, learn time signatures and all that yeah. <laughs> fuck shit yeah, <laughs> that yeah. drummers get concerned with. Um, I mean, I, I have done that. Like, that's pretty much like that was a big part of the lessons was doing a lot of the stickings and yep. doubles and the snare exercises and stuff like that. Um, I mean, there there were two kits in there, mm-hmm. but a lot of the lessons and the approach in there w- was here's something that I want you to work on. Bring it back next week and let's see how much improvement you made on it. And how long were you taking like the the adult lessons for? Uh, last year, uh, I want to say it was maybe two, about two months, two and a half months. Okay, so six to eight lessons ish. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, enough for where I thought I could take some stuff home, mm-hmm. use it. You know, just uh, the most. I think the biggest thing that I took from those lessons actually is unlearning poor habits interesting you know yeah, with yeah, yeah. uh being kind of one-sided and uh, a lot of drummers if you're a lefty or a righty you know it's like you're leading with your left you know mm-hmm. where you should be leading with your right you want to kind of be more symmetrical instead of being one side like you should essentially be able to do, do everything on either side of sure. your body yeah, yeah, yeah. you know so that's something that i've been striving to do a lot more um do you play like 
cross-handed or open-handed? Very interesting question. When I first started, I used I started open-handed. Okay. I think my dad literally set up my drum set when I was 10 lefty just because I was left-handed. Okay. So strangely enough, I started kind of as a righty on a lefty kit with an open do you now play drums right-handed? No. You still play left. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I've gone traditionally to cross. Interesting. Yeah. The reason I ask is because I was wa- you were mentioning the symmetry thing, uh, and I was watching, uh, I was at a Chain Twist show last night. Shout out Chain Twist. I know they're listening. I was watching Ryan, their drummer drum. Uh, shout out Ryan. I know he's probably going to hear this as well, so I hope you're having a beautiful day, Ryan. <laughs> uh, he was playing, he plays open, and it's like, it's fascinating to me, again, in this context of me now understanding drums. Like, I never noticed anyone playing open or yeah. closed. Like, it just never was a thing that came to my brain. Sure. Watching him play was interesting, because as I was realizing, like, when I play drums, when I'm learning drums, I, my hands are crossed which means that my right hand is always doing like the eighth notes and my left hand is on the snare or whatever. Mm-hmm. When he's open, he's like switching hands. So it is very symmetrical in that sense. Sure. Of, like the snare is switching from left to right hand. And that means that the other hand is like, and it was a really interesting, yeah, to your point of being symmetrical. And yeah. it was an interesting like revelation to me of like, that's an, a way more advanced seeming way of doing drums and a way more like healthy and balanced way of drums. Whereas for me, it's like, my left hand can only do this, and my right hand can sure. do this, but if my left hand has to go faster, like, I'm fucked. I just don't have that yet. Yeah. Uh, so it was interesting to yeah, watch him do that, and it struck me for the first time of, like, huh, that is a very balanced and symmetrical way to play sure. drums. And I've heard people talk about, yeah, leading left-handed or right-handed and that, how that's not a an ideal way to play drums. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, yeah, it was interesting to watch him go open and for me to be like, oh, that is as balanced and symmetrical as you can get. Strangely enough, I believe it's more common to play traditionally Mm cross-handed than it is to be open-handed. I think that's, yeah, that's the way that I, in my YouTube university, that's what everyone said to do, so that's what I tried to do, yeah. Um, I don't, honestly, I've never, like, looked too far into it as far as which way is more advantageous or Mm not. Um, Like I said, I I had started as open-handed, but just naturally, I don't even remember when it happened. I just started started going cross-handed again. yeah. But now it makes me wonder if if my dad had like set up my kit righty, mm-hmm. would I have been a righty drummer? Because honestly, dude, I hate being a lefty drummer. It sucks because yeah. everyone, you know, every yep. time there's a show, they're like, "Oh, you're gonna we're oh, gonna use the house, yeah, we're gonna use the house Fuck. kit, we're yeah. gonna use the house kit." So people don't have to you know switch stuff around. And I'm like, well, <laughs> we're switching really everything. Ha- we have really no choice, you know. And of course, ah, oh, I didn't even think about that later. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. I, I mean, it's not like I'm not willing to let people use my stuff, but not a lot of people can because yeah. everything's lefty. My pedals are lefty. Yeah. Um. You know, I, I don't mind like you know let, letting people use symbols and stuff, but I'm like like I I bought my my dream kit like a couple like a couple years ago, and I'm Hell like yes. super protective. It's yeah. like my child, and I'm just like <laughs> yeah. I'm like uh, the throne is just like maybe off by a centimeter. I'm like someone was sitting here. <laughs> Who put their nuts on my drum set? <laughs> <laughs> Shout out! What is the Step Brothers? Uh, what the fuck oh movie is God, that? Step Brothers. Step yeah. Brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hell yes. The I'm interesting. I grew up a sports kid, and in sports, being lefty is such a huge advantage normally. Oh, for sure. Uh, and I, the example in my brain is that Rafael Nadal is a tennis player who's lefty, and he's born right-handed. And his dad, at four years old, is like, "You're going to be lefty," because in tennis, like the way the ball spins, lefty is different than righty, and because it's different, people have seen it less, and that makes it more effective. I guess mm-hmm. it's like being a lefty pitcher in baseball sure. would be the equivalent here of like everyone has seen a right-handed curveball more than they've seen a left-handed curveball, so that when it moves differently, it's way harder, maybe not way harder for the context of the pros, but for idiots like me, (laughs) it's much harder to digest. Uh, And yeah, it's interesting. I never thought about how in music, it's such a a disaster for the context of a drummer, where like a a guitar doesn't really matter if you're left-handed or right-handed. I guess it's probably harder to buy a left-handed guitar and find one, but like, there's not that many times that I feel like you're like passing guitar back and forth. But backlining the kit is a a real common thing that happens. And I never thought about how... I recently have been thinking about like, oh, it's annoying that like someone puts their crash here and their ride here and it must be hard to like, yeah, adjust to the different heights of shit. I never thought about, yeah, flipping the kit fully. It's always like that. Have you ever had to play on a right-handed kit? Has there ever been a time where they were like, you cannot do your shit? You have to figure this out? Yes. It was only when I was really young. I filled in for a 80s cover band called Aquanet. Oh, I'm in love with this. Please tell me. <laughs> and, inject this into my bit. Uh, I think I, I don't even remember. I was like, oh, geez. Uh 10, 11, 12, 13. I was really young. Yeah. I was young. But I mean, a lot of eighties a lot of eighties music is, you know, yeah. pretty straightforward for it's what for, I can play on the drums. <laughs> but for stuff like that, I could get away with mm-hmm. it so long as there's like let's say a double pedal. Yeah. Because for me to feel comfortable on a righty on a righty kit, I'd have to play open handed yep. and use the 
secondary yeah, yeah, yeah. drum pedal. Yep. You know yep. what I mean? Yep. But I'd have to close the hi hat shut. So yeah, you know what I mean. I mean it's doable, and you know I take advantage Fuck. of it yeah. too a little bit because it, it's cool to still like rip around on a righty kit. Like sure. I can still kind of dabble and stuff like that because mm -hmm. I've been trying to do the symmetry thing anyways. But anytime I have any of my boys that play drums come over and they just sit there and they're like. I just, it's just, they're like flabbergasted. They're like, oh my God, a lefty drum set. Like, That's I, funny. It, like, cause I, I'm, I'm obviously a lot more exposed to righty kits than people are lefties. I don't even, yeah. I think the, the numbers are somewhere like in the single digits for like lefty drummers versus righty drummers. Yep. You know, my, um, my childhood best friend was left handed growing up. And so our favorite, we would like throw a football, throw a baseball, and we'd get like bored and then go, okay, trade baseball gloves. And now I'm throwing lefty and catching righty. And it was <laughs> the, our favorite game. We'd do it all in every context of every sport, of everything we ever did. There was That's a fun. point where we would go, fuck it, switch, trade. That's awesome. And it was such a fun, yeah, to watch each other just be so bad at the thing. Of course, we're just laughing our heads off as eight-year-olds just watching the other person like try and throw with their weak hand. And I did have a friend that was truly ambidextrous, like... Damn, yeah. Throws perfectly with both hands, can write with both hands. Like, I'm like, how does that happen? Like my mom does that actually. Really? I I'm gonna I'm gonna confuse which ones. Uh the gist of it is I I think she writes on paper right handed and on a chalkboard left handed, or vice versa. And it's because she grew up in South America and they wouldn't let her write with her left hand, so she had to learn to write right handed. Ah, and I'm forgetting like which one she writes. Blasphemy on. or something like yeah, that. It's yeah, it's just yeah. Catholic school at the time yeah. was very traditional, very strict. Like, no, this is how you do things. Yeah. Uh, and I'm forgetting. Yeah, she's gonna listen to this as well and correct me when I see her. But <laughs> yeah, it's uh, she writes on the chalkboard or yeah, whiteboard with one hand, on a paper with the other hand. And I'm forgetting which one's which. But yeah, same shit. I find it very interesting. Um, people that suffer from like severe epilepsy, I mm -hmm. think it's too much. Um, communication between yep. the hemispheres of the brain yeah, yeah. so they'll actually divide the hemispheres in yeah. half i think it's like the corpus callosum or something like that yes i'm a psych major and i should know this better than i do but yeah. when when yeah. they divide the brain like that they independently operate so you can mm -hmm. like they can these these folks can now do things it, yep. like a like i don't even know in in parallel like they yeah. can like write in cursive in one hand and be drawn shapes in the other like you know the thing where you mm -hmm. do with your kid <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> like i still struggle with that <laughs> I'm not even gonna try because there's a camera on me, and I don't want to find out how bad I am at it. Well, I just, I just find those kind of things so fascinating yeah. that like you, your, your, your brain doesn't actually need to be like yeah. connected, like Yo, in a sense. People go in a coma and come out with a different language that they can speak. How does that make sense? Oh my god, that's not, that's not. We're not getting to the bottom of this. What we are gonna get to the bottom of is my self-proclaimed science guy. Science Corner with Shane Frederick. I don't know who that is. Um, I so for context here, uh, <laughs> there's. I'm gonna give the embarrassing version and then I will qualify you after. So excuse me for 30 seconds while I ruin your Go life. Go for it. Um, so Shane, uh, the eclipse happened just two, three months ago, something like that. I think April 27th. <laughs> Science guy, my bad. <laughs> come on, come on, I, I man. I should have known. Uh, so you went out and you were watching the eclipse in a public park, uh, which is great. There are a lot of folks around you doing it. Uh, and for some reason, Yahoo News was there writing a story on the event. It was the local local news, but it got it, it ended got up, picked up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's a better story if it was an international publication. So the BBC <laughs> was there documenting it. David Attenborough was uh, yes, there. He himself in the flesh. Um, <laughs> And so they put a whole head of the eclipse and of the park and of the how the park gave out glasses to folks in a beautiful community event and all this great stuff. Uh, poor Shane <laughs> gets yeah asked to comment on this. And I wrote the quote down here because it made me laugh so fucking hard <laughs> that the quote from the article uh, was that, quote, a self-proclaimed science guy, an amateur astronomer, <laughs> Shane Frederick, uh, had a telescope that drew a crowd. Uh and so they go on to talk about the crowd. And yes, this idea that they quoted you saying, calling yourself a self-proclaimed science guy is so like derogatory. <laughs> where it's like pretentious. Yeah, it's not like, and I, it, it resonated with me because I interview people all the time, like in this context, but also the more applicable context is I work with the, the fall and spring shows at colleges. And so a lot of that's interviewing students. And I'm very aware that I'm interviewing an 18 year old who's like, they're a child still, and for all intents and purposes. And so as they're saying things, it's very important to me that like I, I am portraying them in a flattering way because I don't want them to like say something 18 that they trust me with. And then I, yeah, misrepresent them. I put sure. it bad or like, like the common example of this is kids always love to, or uh, I'm saying, you know, why it's so great to have a concert on campus. And usually what the students will say is like, well, school is really hard and there's a lot of work and it kind of sucked being here sometimes. So it's nice to have a concert. And it's like, well, I don't really want to put that out there because I don't want you to be advertised 
speaking on behalf of your school saying my school kind of sucks sometimes. Like, I know what you're saying. I know that you're a student and that's how a student feels, but like, it's not a flattering representation. It's not really an honest representation of what you meant. And yeah, it just feels like I'm misrepresenting what you intended. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw this, I was like, oh, that's what they did to Shane. It's like, you gave them your trust. Like you trusted with them, with your image, with your identity. And you said something to them that was honest and they clipped it out of context and made it sound, took it from genuine to, yeah, pretentious God. to, to self-inflated, -inf like, just, yeah, just fucked it all up for you. And I felt, I felt bad for you. I love you enough that it was funny to read. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's already out in the, you know, in the uh, internet world, so. Yes, yeah. and I am boosting the reach of it, so <laughs> shout out me for making your life even worse. My bad. That's uh, awesome. The interesting part of this to me that I want to chat about is, like, yes, they said that the, the telescope drew, like, a crowd of people. So I guess yes. my context of like what is special about your telescope as an <laughs> amateur astronomer uh yes are you looking at stars often what is special about your telescope yes nerd out on me for a second learn me about astronomy and what you were going through that day i had wanted a telescope for a long time um i i've loved astronomy for many many like since i was a kid i always loved just looking at the stars and pointing out the you know all the little kid stuff oh there's the big dipper sure, you yeah, know yeah. oh there's a uh, polaris and all this stuff Orion's um, belt, shout out. Or Yo, Orion, you there? <laughs> if you're watching. Um, CCSU, uh, where I went to school, had uh, they, they still have it. They have a massive sit-in, uh, I think it's like a Castle Grain telescope. Okay. It's like, a, one, it's like a huge dome. Yeah, it sounds like a Star Wars contraption, it, like a nuts. telescope looked, you can sit inside. It looks like a cannon. It's okay. amazing. Um, wow. Hell yes. Prior to at COVID. At CCSU? Yeah, Central. On, Interesting. On uh, uh, the Copernicus building. Interesting. Yes. If you're in the area and you and you're able to point out the Copernicus building, look up top. There's this big white dome. Okay. That's the telescope. Excuse me. Interesting. Okay. So uh, prior to COVID, um, they used to open the telescope viewing for the public ev uh, every first and last Saturday of the month. We happened to hit it right, and it was a. I can't. I can't even like begin to tell you the experience of what it's like to look at like the moon with that much power it's it's so nuts it's like you can almost just like you can almost like jump in the telescope and just be there like all yeah. of the textures the canyons the shadows mm -hmm. like the shimmer of the atmosphere i mean it's it was like absolutely mind-blowing interesting okay so, so i think that's what kind of put me on the path to investing Were you like in taking a class to do this or yeah was this like a, a club was this a hobby what yes. was the context of this so I mean, I had switched my major like three million times. Like I started as a psych major, then I switched to, um, uh, what the hell? I don't even know. What, um, Something that's not psych. <laughs> I can't believe I'm just drawing a blank on this. Um, it's just earth sciences. Okay. So G, like just like a lot of the stone studies and yep. mineral studies yeah, and yeah. earth, earth and life yeah. history. And then I finally stopped at computer science and math. Thank God. Because I was but, just getting yeah. sick of just switching in and out. Yeah. So then, it's probably the easiest to get a job of the three fields. Also, so. oh, I, lo I see. Yeah. I, I love CS, but the whole, but, but just sw segueing back, I didn't. I took the math minor not because I'm not like I can't like do like simple adding and subtraction in my head. I'm not doing like I don't got a whiteboard <laughs> in my bedroom and I'm like doing yeah. integrations and figuring out the trajectory of planets and stuff. But it was just kind of cool because it was like because math to me is like the expression of the universe in a very like universal way. Sure. So I just found it like super cool like that you can get in it infinitely close to something without touching it. <laughs> Like mm -hmm. I just weird like concepts yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, I'm not, I, I don't do anything with the math, but it's just, sure. it was cool to take. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyways, um, being in that, in the, uh, like the science wing, all the students had like special access and stuff. So me and a group of friends went up there and like, they opened it up for us and we were just like looking at the moon and Damn. it was just, it was just freaking super Is it something sick. that like multiple, like it, as you're sitting in the telescope looking, is it like a TV screen that they can see what you're looking at? Or is it like an individual experience? Oh, it's an individual. That yeah. makes it even more special to me somehow. Yeah, because it's just you. Yeah. The, it's pretty much just you in the glass, like yeah, you know, and you know, it's this whole thing. You're sitting in it, and it like rotates. Yeah, and it's it's incredible. Like looking at the planets, that's another ball game. It's, yes, it's nuts. Like you can see like the storms on Jupiter, and you can see the shadow of the rings on. Saturn. <laughs> that's where girls go to get more stupid. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Not going there. <laughs> um, so. I, I ended up getting a telescope for my birthday, and I just went absolutely nuts with it. Like, I started buying certain lenses for it mm. and all of these different filters, and I had gotten a solar filter, which I'd never used before. It's just simply to observe the sun. Mm -hmm. You know, fast forward 
to April, I said, wow, this is, and it was literally sitting brand new in the box. Yep. Haven't even touched it. And I said, well, what, what a better time than now for the solar eclipse. Yeah. The original itinerary was that we were going to go to the path of totality up uh, mm-hmm. more up north in New Hampshire. Yep. But I, I, I don't even, I mean, the numbers were like mind blowing. There was like an so influx of like 500,000 people coming from both international and I national. I saw like a, an overlay of all the planes converging there. And it was nuts, the amount of, like, private jets and, like, bajillions of dollars of people <laughs> going there. It's crazy. Uh, feel free to grab a it's refill if you would like one. Uh, you know there's also water there if you would like to go that route as well. Not chugging. <laughs> Finishing. Um, but, yeah, so we were going to go to Totality. We didn't. We ended up around here. Uh, we have our telescope. We have our sun fills. We're ready to go. And then the BBC and David Attenborough himself come up. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Start chatting with you. <laughs> so, long story short... Harkness Memorial Park, which is in Water... I always get these mixed up. I think it's Waterford, Connecticut. Okay. Or it's Watertown, Waterford. It's one of the waters, near the water. They were hosting a state-sponsored event where on one side of the park, they had the telescopes already up and running for people to observe, and they were handing out glasses. Mm -hmm. I was on the other side doing the same thing, not knowing... I had originally bought two pairs of solar eclipse glasses, but I bought accidentally two pairs of 20. So I have now (laughs) 40 of these solar glasses. I'm like, oh, my God, what am I going to do with these? So then I realized that there's like hundreds and hundreds of people at this park that don't have glasses. Which seems insane. Which seems nuts. How do you get all the way there? (laughs) And like little kids are like looking (laughs) up. I'm like, wait, don't do that. So I'm setting up. I, I was the only kid on the side of this on the side of this park with the telescope with the solar filter and I'm like handing out all of these glasses and you know I was just like oh I got a ton and you know I drew a crowd and people kept asking me they're like oh are you part of the event and I and I was just like are you part of like the state sponsored event and I felt like there was just like some chortly chuckle thing like I didn't Mm -hmm. know what the heck they were talking about I'm like what are you talking about (laughs) no um I'm just like no I just brought my telescope here so you know as the you know, the the eclipse was beginning to happen, I drew a crowd. I got like, you know, 15, 20 people coming in, chatting with me. There was this guy that works at ESPN that was telling me all about, you know, radio broadcasts and this, that. I met a bunch of super interesting people. Very cool. Okay. It was super cool. Yeah. Um, so the same thing, people were asking like what got me into, you know, astronomy and stuff. And mm. this is where I, I will segue into this whole thing. And I, I, I have a love for just science. Like, I went to school for computers. Like, I just, I love all of the disciplines, chemistry, bio. Um, I've dabbled, like, in a bunch of, you know, I took all those kind of electives through both mm-hmm. high school and college just because I, I just, I just, I just intrinsically enjoy that stuff. Great, yeah. Um, so, this leads to the gentleman who will be unnamed that <laughs> works for the local. David Attenborough. For the David, record. damn it, David. Um, came up to me and he starts, uh, you know, just pitching me all these questions. He's like, oh, what, what got you into it? Do you know who's a reporter or is he just a guy? No, he was a reporter. Okay. Like, if you look at the bottom of the article, his name's there. But, like, did you know that he was a reporter and he was talking to you or were you just, like, talking to another person? No, I knew he was oh, a reporter because okay, okay, okay. someone someone had sent – one of, someone that I had met went, knew that that was a reporter and they said, hey, you should interview that guy got, with okay, the telescope. Okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. So he comes trotting over. And he just says, you know, you know, what do you do? Like, would you, did you go to school for this and this, that, and the other thing? And I, and that's when I was just like, oh, you know, I just like a lot of the STEM disciplines, you know, just like a, a dude that loves science, you know, like a science guy, I guess. <laughs> ha ha. Like I said it in a very cute, yes, yes. disarming, humbling way. I didn't say, <laughs> well, I'm a man of science yeah. and I am pro- published in the Journal of Medicine. You know, I... <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I was, I was just like that, that cool kid. You know, I'm like, yeah. yo, man, I just love space. You said and it was like an afterthought, and he wrote it down as if you like led with, "My name is Shane. I'm a science guy." <laughs> I'm like, and then I was so pumped. He's like, "Oh, it'll come out soon." So then I think it was my mom that had found the article. She goes, "I oh, I found the article uh, that you, that mm-hmm. that you're in," and then I started reading it. I'm like, it's kind of one of those things where you're kind of smiling, and it's like that. <laughs> slow frown you're like <laughs> i was just so bummed out i'm like dude this guy made me sound like such a douche yep <laughs> oh my god yeah shout out to that king brother 
We did it. We landed it. That's our hour. That's, a, That's it. <laughs> as good of a way to end the podcast as I could ever have. Mr. Shane Frederick, episode 70. Thank you for coming. Uh, Late in Self is out now. Uh, the song is called Around the Sun. It is available on YouTube. Go stream it. Go listen to it. Um, where can people find you on social media? Where can they follow you? Where can they learn more about your science guy adventures? Oh, man. Uh, just go Shane Frederick on, on Google and that Yahoo article <laughs> will pop up and you can see how pretentious <laughs> I am. Um, but yeah, I, you know, Instagram, <laughs> Facebook, you know, I... I, I Starting to get away from the Facebook thing yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Um, I pretty much just post like some drum drum clips on Instagram Hell and yes. stuff, you know. I should definitely be promoting a little bit more though. Okay. You know? Let's do it. You Send know, people to the Instagram. It. I'll have it in the description. Thank you so um, much, Peter. Dude, honestly, this has been this has been amazing. My pleasure. Always a treat to catch up. I'm excited yes. to get into the even better conversation. Oh yeah. yeah <laughs> now the microphones are out of the way. <laughs> yeah, buddy. I know. Hell yes. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far, please do leave a like or comment on the video. It does help, and I hate asking for it, uh, but it does it does help. So leave a like. Do something good. Tell Shane he's cute and adorable. Go follow him. Support the song. Go listen to it. Um, have a great time. Go do some science. Love, love you, love you to pieces. Have a beautiful life, friends. Thanks for listening. To episode 70 from everyone with Shane Frederick.